I'm a filmmaker, and I'm here to tell you that the lens is the greatest invention of all time. It's sleek, it's symbolic, it's pragmatic. It's given us names like De Niro, like Denzel, like Tom Cruise. Okay, well, I never said it was perfect. <laughs> but the most powerful thing about the lens is that it gives us perception. It gives us the ability to see one another in a certain light. And perception is important because the way we see one another directly impacts the way we treat one another. And I'm passionate about capturing the human condition on screen and creating films about these phenomenon. Now, along with Homero Salinas Jr., I co-founded El Renevatio Films, and we've produced films on the social conditions, taking social theory, putting them on screen in hopes of engaging the audience in a discussion, mobilizing and pioneering change. And we did that with our last film. We worked with Dr. Aaron Tyler and other consultants and advisors from Israel and from the West Bank, and we came together to focus on a film project based on this idea of perception. How is it that we perceive one another? How do communities perceive one another, particularly communities in conflict? Now, before we started, we had to acknowledge we weren't trying to make a film that encapsulated the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We hoped to try to make a teaching tool that identified certain patterns within communities, within societies, that enabled particular perceptions that drove perceptions forward, that sustained status quo perceptions on how we see one another. And so in the end, after months of work, we focused on the image of the enemy. Now the image of the enemy is a sociological concept that describes a negative perception, usually held by groups, either consciously or unconsciously, used to justify violence or oppression of others. So after months of developing this project and having an idea in mind, our advisors finally said, now come and see for yourself. So we did. We embraced our curiosity. We embraced our ignorance. And we headed for the Middle East. Invariably, there were challenges. For example, language barriers, cultural barriers. I mean, we're two filmmakers from South Texas. We knew little about these conflicts, these communities, other than what we saw perpetuated in the media, what we watched on CNN. I actually recall our first encounter with an Israeli citizen. We were on the ground, and we were asking, very, very inquisitive. We asked, you know, where, okay, where should, we, where should we start? Where should we head? We, we want to learn about, about the culture and this perception. And he was very open and said, oh, well, I mean, this is laced in history. These are our lands. Come visit this. And we took notes. And he said, this is Yad Vashem, the museum and the Holocaust. And we took notes. And then he said, oh, and do you know Falafel? And my partner, Omero, said, Falafel? Hmm, no, we haven't met him yet. <laughs> so our host welcomed us. And we traveled the territories trying to capture these, these narratives on the ground. And our hopes were to identify structures that enable this image of the enemy. What are people doing on the ground? What institutions and policies can we identify that enable these negative perceptions? But what's more, what are people doing to counter that narrative, to change the paradigm? So one of the first modes that really enable these negative perceptions that we learn from the people on the ground was a culture of isolation. This is just one example. So we started, we walked through the United Nations refugee camp to learn and capture the narrative of the Palestinian refugee. And we walked through the camps, we're welcome in, into his home, and he expressed to us a great deal of isolation. He did not only just feel isolated, from his community, from his heritage, but from the rest of the world. We moved forward. We gained access into the Jewish settlements in the West Bank to learn the narrative of the settler. And what we learned was a great deal of insecurity as well, not just isolated from his neighbors culturally, ethnically, but isolated from his countrymen. And we travel the territories and we identify these militarized checkpoints and have young people engage with one another. We were able to speak with young Israeli soldiers and they shared their narrative with us. And they feel a great deal of social, educational, 
isolation from young people on the other side of conflict. And the same could be said for the young Palestinians who shared their narrative with us. And we walk and we see these structures, as we can see on, on screen. We see these structures that are built as barriers in the cities as we walk through Bethlehem, as we walk through Jerusalem. And these barriers are important as we lead to the next part of patterns that we identified. I see these structures represent communities isolated from one another. We have no contact with people on the other side. These structures stand for physiological, physical, and psychological barriers. The next step is semantics. As we just saw with these structures that divide and, and are enabled in, in communities, the way we refer to one another, the, way, the words we use to describe one another, the way we use to describe symbols of conflict matter, and they're important, they're sensitive, and deeply rooted in history and context. As we just saw these, this structure, if one finds himself on a particular side of conflict, they'd refer to it as an apartheid wall. If you find yourself on the other side, you'd refer to it as a security barrier. Language matters. The words that we use matter. Blanket terms are used. From the voices and the narratives that we captured, blanket terms are used to cover entire populations. Words like the terrorist. Words like the occupier. And see, these words we must be sensitive to and try to reflect where we can see these types of patterns in our own society. And we move forward, and the third pattern that we identified, that the voices on the ground shared with us and that we witnessed was encounters. And what I mean to say by this is that there are few safe spaces for people on opposing viewpoints, of opposing sides, have to have a productive dialogue, for them to be able to change the perception of one another. And so we were at demonstrations. We went to protests. And these are the areas that they have available many times to encounter one another. Many times, when someone of opposing viewpoints come together, it's under a hostile condition. And as you've just seen there, when you live in generations of isolation, when you paint one another with inflammatory language, and the first time that you come together is at a demonstration, at a protest, at a checkpoint, at a border crossing. A nonviolent encounter can quickly escalate to an encounter that is violent, quickly escalate to a siege, to a battle, to years of war. And that cycle is incredibly hard to break. Now, I'm incredibly grateful for the voices, the narratives that were shared with us. Voices like Ophir, like Zogby, like Gershon, the voices in our film of the clips that you just saw that were ex excerpts taken. And I'm grateful for them because they are working to change the narrative, working against the status quo dialogue to bring people together from all walks of life, from all sides of the conflict. Working with Dr. Tyler and Omero, and we put our heads together to try to use this as a teaching tool not to focus on a particular specific conflict, but to be used in conflicts all over the world for us to begin to identify these patterns. And so I'd like you guys to reflect, where can we in our society, in our culture, identify patterns of isolation, of semantics or language, of hostile encounters? We think to isolation here in the United States and we think of the income inequality issue and how communities are divided by opportunity. We think of semantics, and we think of the caricature that we've painted with inflammatory language, the narrative that we've created to paint the immigrant as a person who's not coming here to better himself or to give herself a better opportunity, but now we've created this narrative, this perception of someone who is an economic threat, someone who is a threat to our national security. And where can we identify hostile encounters? As we can see clearly, and the encounters and the spaces that we have, the way we police ourselves, the perception we have amongst communities of color and law enforcement. So we can identify these things. We can take from other conflicts around the world and try to apply them here and use this as a teaching tool in that way. But what's next? Once we begin to de-escalate these patterns of this image of the enemy, where do we go from there? 
I remember as we were wrapping up our time in the West Bank and in Israel, we, one of our hosts said, hey, I want, you to, I, want to meet, uh, I want you to meet my uncle. He's a dentist, very insightful. We're going to go up to his, suite, uh, his surgical suite. He's, I, I'd love for you to meet him. We said, fantastic. So we went up there. And uh, it was 7, 8 p.m. at night. And we walk up there and we, in, in fact, walk into a surgical suite while surgery was going on, which is uncommon for me as a physician here in the United States. We, I wasn't, we weren't scrubbed in. I suppose this was, this was a, a custom, a way that we were not, I suppose, culturally uh, privy to. So we stand there and he, he brings us coffee, sweet bread, everything very welcoming. And he says, listen, you boys are here to, to make a film about conflict and said, yes, sir, we're here to, to try to capture and learn about perception and about points of view. And he said, okay. Hundreds of people come from the United States all the time to try to, to, to make a film, make a you know, show, do something for TV. I want you to keep one thing in mind. Don't make the same mistake. Please, I ask, don't dominate our narrative. Don't dominate our conversation. And he asked me for a second thing. He said, while you're here, while you're here in our territories, in our communities, do one thing. Listen. Just listen. And so our recipe, our prescription for how we can continue to counter negative perceptions is through active listening. And we can do this in three ways. The first is to adopt the idea of cognitive awareness. What does it mean to be cognitively aware? It means that we ad adopt the ideas of reason and rationale. We are all riddled with biases, all riddled with ideology. But we must check that at the door the best way we can and come to the table and embrace reason and rationale in our discourse, in our dialogue, so we can begin to seek to understand, which is the second part of active listening. We must seek to understand one another at all costs. And this is difficult for many because understanding often gets confused for agreeing. But just because I understand you, just because I understand your point of view, doesn't mean that we agree. It doesn't mean that I have to sacrifice my ideals and my integrity. But we must seek to understand one another. And lastly, narrative humility. We all have a story that drives us, that makes us who we are, that is laced in history and context. But ours is not the only story. We can't dominate the conversation. We must be open to listening to the narratives across the table, across the way. And with that, I'd like to now just end on, we essentially have the tools. We have a brief introduction on how we can counter the narrative and how we can adjust our perception. And in that sense, we're all now filmmakers. So I ask you guys to change your lens with me together. Thank you.